families and children who are just trying to show God's love. A group of women in our neighborhood were talking about how can we find ways to serve in a meaningful way with our children. And we all had a growing heart, not only for children, but for refugee families. And shortly after that meeting in my living room, the Love Your Neighbor Club was formed. The mission of the Love Your Neighbor Club is to serve children in our community and refugee families with our children alongside of us. About a year ago, I got a phone call um, from our church, and there was a call out for finding a woman to come alongside um, another woman who was a resettled refugee. Chur had three children, and her husband had recently died in a car accident. And since I had gotten the phone call from our church, God was nudging me and saying, Ellie, this, this could be you, this could be you. I said, okay. It'll be me. She and I were able to visit and, you know, she started crying. And I thought, gosh, I don't know how I would be able to keep it together. She's just lost her best friend, her husband. She's come to this country and she's got three kids that are my kids' ages. So a friendship sparked in all of that, in this shared humanity. Because on paper, she and I, we were living identical lives. Elevate last year was doing Peter Pan and reached out to her and said, would you and your kids like to meet up with me and my kids and we'll go see this play together? And she said, we've never been to a play. They came up to Kesslinger and the kids got to meet each other and they lined up perfectly in age. The kids are chatting and we take our seats and all of a sudden she gets really quiet and she just breaks into tears. And she takes my hand and she said, Ellie, I have to tell you, in my whole life, I've never had a friend before. You are my first friend. And I give thanks to God for you and for your family. Thank you for inviting us today. And so here are two women sitting there with our kids all around us and we're both sobbing and Peter Pan was awesome. But that was just the beginning of, it's been a beautiful friendship where I think I have learned more about my faith through Chur. How can you bring about justice with a small group of families and children who are just trying to show God's love? Once you see the, the ties that bind us, once you see our common and shared humanity, compassion follows. I love what, you're, what you just saw, what's happening in the Love Your Neighbor Club with Ellie LeBron and uh, caring for immigrants and refugees. And I love what she said. How can you bring about justice? Well, it's relational. It's caring about the person next door, an opportunity to love them, to love your neighbor. And so you're going to hear about that and stories like that about people in Chapel Street Church and in our community who are working for justice on relational level uh, every day in our community as we go through this series and justice for all. Today we begin a brand new series speaking about justice. Now I know that word is a bit of a trigger word. It's highly politicized. It means different things to different people. And some of you even right now have preconceived notions and ideas about what we ought to say or ought not to say. I'm going to ask all of us to trust God and to lay those preconceived notions aside and let him speak to us about his heart for justice, because I think he has some things that will surprise us, encourage us, and perhaps even challenge us and shake us up a bit. The, the idea of justice is, some, is in us from the very beginning. I think kids early on have a sense of what's fair or what's right. Moms and dads, you know this. How many times have you heard your little ones say, it's not fair, that's not fair. And most often, our sense of justice is developed when something feels unfair to us or what we want. My daughter Hannah tells a story of being in fourth grade. I actually asked her, tell me a story of when you felt something was unfair as a child. She said, all of life was unfair when I was a child. <laughs> but she said when she was in fourth grade, her class did a little object lesson on segregation and injustice in American history. And so half of the class got special treats and privileges and, and, and were treated well, and half the class were, were not treated so well. And ha it bothered Hannah, even though she knew it was an object lesson, and she wasn't given candy. That was the big thing. And at the end of the day, the teacher said that she felt bad for those kids who didn't get the candy, so she gave everybody another piece of candy. And Hannah said to this day, she still feels it was unjust that those kids got two pieces of candy, and it wasn't fair. 
And so today, by the way, is Super Bowl Sunday, the Super Bowl, and uh, We'll, I have no idea who's going to win, but I will tell you this. I think it's somewhat unjust that Tom Brady is in another Super Bowl with another team. I think that's unfair. But I don't know who's going to win, but I do know this. At some point in the game, there's going to be a very close call, and the, the referees are going to go to the replay booth, and they're going to watch in super slow-mo something to try to get it exactly right. Why? Because it matters. You want to get the call right. In a sense, when we talk about justice, there's something in us that wants things to be right. To get, getting things right really matters. This desire for it to be right and fair runs very deep inside of us, but it also runs wrong and gets corrupted if we don't let God shape it. Uh, but that word justice is, again, highly politicized, and it means different things. But fundamentally, justice is not political. Justice is biblical. It's biblical, not political. And that's crucial for us. So if you're tempted to dismiss this conversation because you just don't want to be, I don't want to get into politics. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about God's heart as revealed to us in Scripture. It's critical that we define and understand justice on God's terms and not those of our culture. Sometimes there's alignment. Sometimes there's overlap between what our culture says is just and what God's Word says. But very often, there's not alignment. And when that happens, we have to be crystal clear about where we're going to align our hearts and there are lots of very interesting and nuance, uh, nuances regarding the biblical words and the approach to justice in Scripture. But at its most basic level, we could say it this way, justice is about setting things right. Justice is about setting wrong things right. The Hebrew word most often translated justice in the, in the Old Testament is the word mishpat. We'll talk about that in weeks to come. Literally meaning to make right. Right choices, right decisions, right judgments, right outcomes, right ordering of society, right relationships. Sounds simple enough. Just make things right. But who decides what's right? Who determines what the standard of rightness is? That's where things always get slippery and tricky. And for us, what is right and just is rooted in the heart and character of God. And that is revealed to us in his word. If you're taking notes, write this one down. What is just and right is, is rooted in the character of God, who he is. And we know who he is by what he's revealed to us in his word. He is the standard of justice. God is not conforming himself to some standard outside of himself. He is the standard of what is just and right. And we must conform our ideas of justice to him, not the other way around. Listen to what A.W. Tozer writes in his book, The Knowledge of the Holy. He says, justice, when used of God, is a name we give to the way that God is, nothing more. And when God acts justly, he's not doing so to conform to an independent criterion, but he's simply acting like himself in a given situation. Everything in the universe is good or just to the degree that it conforms to the nature of God, and it is evil or unjust as it fails to do so. Simply put, justice flows from the heart of God. Justice flows from the heart of God. So in places like Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse 20, when we're told, seek justice and only justice shall you pursue, we're really being told to seek and to pursue the heart of God. Or, for example, in Proverbs 28, verse 5, evil men do not understand justice at all, but those who seek the Lord understand it completely. The Old Testament has a lot to say about justice, and we're going to deal with that later in the series. But I want to start with a passage from the New Testament, a passage where Jesus is announcing why he came, and it has everything to do with the gospel and with justice. Luke chapter 4, verses 16 through 30. And he came to Nazareth, where he'd been brought up, as was his custom. He went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor." And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And all spoke well of him, and marveled at the gracious words that were coming from his mouth. And they said, Is not this Joseph's son? And he said to them, Doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, Physician, heal yourself. What we have heard you did at Capernaum, do here in your hometown as well. 
And he said, truly I say to you, no prophet is acceptable in his hometown. But in truth, I tell you, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the heavens were shut up three years and six months, and a great famine came over all the land. And Elijah was sent to none of them, but only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon, to a woman who was a widow. And there were many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed, but only Naaman the Syrian. When they heard these things, all in the synagogue were filled with wrath, and they rose up and drove him out of the town and brought him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built so that they could throw him down the cliff. But passing through their midst, he went away. This is such a remarkable story. Jesus has been baptized in the Jordan River by John the Baptist. He's been tempted in the wilderness, and he returns to his roots. He returns back to the northern region, Galilee, uh, around the Sea of Galilee, where he grew up. And he does some miracles there. He speaks in different synagogues there in Capernaum and other towns nearby. And then on the Sabbath day, one Sabbath day, he goes to his hometown, Nazareth, the place he grew up. Now you'll remember when we, later in the Gospels when uh, Jesus announced this, the, one of the disciples this uses the phrase, can anything good come from Nazareth? This is not um, a, a bustling metropolis that's well thought of. This is kind of backwater area. And Jesus goes to his hometown, kind of in the sticks, and he goes to his local synagogue. Like you going back to your small town roots and going to the church that you grew up in. Little country church. And he's kind of a celebrity. He's, there's a buzz about Jesus. He's, he, news about him has been spreading in the region. People are excited that this, this new rabbi who everybody's talking about grew up here and he's coming home. And so, of course, they give him the place of honor. He's the honored guest. A typical synagogue service worked like this. There would be um, the reading of the Shema, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, singing of some psalms, a reading from the law, and then a reading from the prophets, at which point the visiting rabbi would sit and teach, meaning expound on what had just been read. So Jesus is given this opportunity. He takes the scroll of Isaiah. So not a Bible with pages, verse numbers, and chapters. A scroll. Massive scroll. The Isaiah scroll was huge. He unrolls it right to the spot he wants. So it's not like looking up a verse. He just unrolls it, and maybe he's done this before, you think. Finds the passage he wants, and he reads what we would call Isaiah chapter 61, verses 1 and 2. And everyone there knew exactly what he was talking about, or at least they thought they did. They knew this is a messianic text. This is a prophecy about the Messiah, the deliverer of Israel, the one who will come to set free God's people Israel from their oppressors, the Romans. The first thing I want you to see is the person of justice. We're going to get to the content of the message and the prophecy, but the first thing that, is, that, is, that Jesus says to this, about this well-known and well-loved prophecy is that it is about him. He says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. It's talking about me, he says. Uh, and the, really, this is drawing out the implications of what happened in the previous chapter in Luke 3, 22. And the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove, and a voice came from heaven. You are my beloved son. With you I'm well pleased. A picture of the Trinity here at Jesus' baptism. You have the voice of the Father, the person of the Son, and the presence of the Spirit. And Jesus now in the synagogue as the Son, beloved Son, speaking, saying, the Spirit is upon me. The words of the Father. This is a shocking announcement. An incredibly dramatic moment, actually. Let's read it again, 20, verses 20 and 21 of chapter 4. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. You could have heard a pin drop. And he began to say to them, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. The drama is thick. He reads just this one portion, rolls it up, hands it back, sits down. Seating, sitting was the posture to teach for a rabbi. I'd like to try that, maybe. And he gives a one-sentence sermon. Maybe you'd think you should try that, Pastor Jeff. <laughs> Perfect exposition of this messianic prophecy in one statement. Only Jesus can do that. He says, all these things that God is going to do, all this justice he's going to bring about, is in me. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He's anointed me. He sent me. 
He's the one who will accomplish these things. The book of Hebrews tells us that Jesus is the exact imprint of the nature of God, the the radiance of his glory. Justice flows from the heart of God, and Jesus is a picture of the heart of God in flesh. This is important for us because it means that the justice, the rightness we seek in the world will not be brought about or accomplished by political power or legislation alone. It won't be achieved through education or economic reform, although those things have their place. But ultimately speaking, those of us who follow Christ, we know and we hold on to the truth that justice will only be accomplished ultimately in, through, and by the person of Jesus Christ, the person of justice. And because Jesus is proclaiming something, Good news, he says, the gospel. But it's not just good news for individuals. It's the gospel of the kingdom. Look what he says in Luke 4, 43. He said to them, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to other towns as well, for I was sent for this purpose. The good news, the gospel of what God has done and will do in Christ, of the kingdom. It has implications for how the world works. This brings us to the proclamation of justice. The proclamation of justice. Really, there's a, there's a five-fold ministry uh, or, or pronouncement here of the Messiah, and we're going to walk through them briefly. First, good news to the poor. He says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me to preach good news for the poor. Good news is the word you and Gelion. But who are the poor? It's a good announcement. It's glad tidings for the poor. You might think, well, that sounds kind of obvious, but there's a lot of scholarly debate about who the poor are, who the blind are, the captive, the oppressed, these categories that are listed for us, these four categories. Who are they? Who's, who's the prophet speaking about? Is he talking about the actually blind? Jesus did heal some blind men. Or the spiritually blind? Is he talking about the materially, financially poor? Or is he talking about the spiritually? poor in spirit. In Matthew's gospel and the Beatitudes, blessed are the poor. In Luke's gospel, the Beatitudes, the same story, blessed are the poor in spirit. Actually, I said that that's reversed. But the point is, what's he talking about here? The answer is yes. It's both. There's a particular order in which we need to understand these. All throughout the Bible, it is the outsider, the outcast, those in the margins who seem to get it, quote unquote. Slave girl, Roman centurion, lepers, widows, Samaritans, Ethiopian eunuchs, and the list goes on and on. Those on the margins seem to have an advantage. Why? Because they recognize their need. They know they're not on the inside. They know they're poor. They know that they're blind. They know that they're being oppressed. Those who recognize their spiritual poverty know they can be saved only by a gift. All you bring to Jesus is your need and your desperation. What's the great hymn? Nothing in my hand I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. That's spiritual poverty. If, that's, if, you, if you're not there, then you don't understand good news. It begins there. Second, liberty to the captives. Liberty to the captives. The word liberty is aphesis. It's a Greek word meaning to release, to set free. It can also be translated to forgive. The heart of the gospel is that the first thing in this world that needs to be set right is not out there. It's in here. What needs to be set right is you and me first. Galatians chapter 5 verse 1, the apostle Paul puts it this way. For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm therefore and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Jesus is speaking about the spiritual slavery of our sin. Sin impoverishes us, it makes us poor and desperate, and it enslaves us. And I need to be set free and set right, and so do you. Next, sight to the blind. Do you know that you're blind, or do you think you can see just fine? (laughs) Blind people don't think they can see, do they? I mean, do blind people think I I can see? Well, actually, uh, I wear readers now to read uh, all the time. And for a long time, I used to complain about being able to not be able to read at night, but my wife told me, you need to get readers. And I said, I don't need glasses. I felt like that's something that an old person does. I don't need glasses. We were in the Walmart checkout line one time, and I was trying to read the label on something we had purchased, and she pulls a pair of readers and hands them to me, and I put them on, and I was like, I can see! I can see! It was, it was seriously kind of life-changing. I had no idea how blind I was until I put these little Walmart readers on my nose, and it's changed. The, I need new ones now. I think I need an actual prescription. But the point is, 
we don't see and we think we do. We are blind. And being healed or set right is coming to recognize our spiritual blindness. Look at what Jesus says in John chapter 9, verse 39. Jesus said, For judgment I came into this world, that those who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. Wait, what? He's not talking about physical sight. He's saying those who, who think they see are the most blind of all. Matthew chapter 13, verses 15 and 16. For this people's heart, Jesus said, has grown callous. They hardly hear with their ears, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes and hear with their ears. Understand with their hearts and turn, and I would heal them. But blessed are your eyes because they see. He connects the hardness of heart, spiritual pride, callousness, with spiritual blindness. Or Revelation chapter 3, verse 17, this striking passage. For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. Jesus is speaking to the church here. You think you're fine. You have no idea the condition you're in. And he came to open our eyes so that we might see, truly see. The paradox is that only those who recognize their blindness are ready to receive sight. So here's the question. Can you say, I'm poor, I'm held captive, and I'm blind? Next, liberty for the oppressed. The same word, aphesis, is used here, liberty, release, set free. But the word for oppressed is a very long, complicated Greek word. I don't even know how to pronounce it very well. Uh, Tethros menos. It means to break in pieces. Uh, And I think that's really interesting. Part of what Jesus is saying, proclaiming he came to do, the good news of justice of the gospel is to restore broken things, to put broken things back together, specifically broken people back together, broken lives, broken relationships. Only those who know they are broken are ready to be put back together. And only those who've been put back together by the grace and justice of Jesus can be used by him to help others get their lives put back together. Finally, the year of the Lord's favor. The year of the Lord's favor. This is a fascinating reference here. Uh, in, in his proclamation, he says that there's these things, he, five-fold announcement, uh, that good news for the poor, liberty for the captives, sight to the blind, liberty for the oppressed, and something called the year of the Lord's favor. What is that? It's a reference in the Old Testament, the book of Leviticus, chapter 25, to the year of Jubilee. Now, here's how this worked. The year of Jubilee in the Old Testament was the culmination of a series of laws that God gave to Israel for the protection of the poor and vulnerable among them. Uh, Every seven years, their debts would be canceled and and slaves would be liberated, and there was a number of uh, different laws and and systems so that the accumulation of wealth wasn't allowed to go on forever and people weren't allowed to be oppressed. And every 50th year, so once in a generation, the year of Jubilee— All debts canceled, all slaves freed, all property and rights returned to its original owners. It's a fascinating thing. Now, who's this good news for? It's good news for those those who owe money. It's good news for those who have lost property and rights. It's good news for those who are uh, in, in, in bondage. Who's it not such good news for? Those who own property. Those who uh, hold a bunch of uh, debts that they're calling in. For the wealthy, for the powerful. And you want to know something? When Isaiah said this, wrote this, Israel had been in the promised land for almost 700 years. That means there should have been roughly 14 year of jubilees. 14 social and economic resets for Israel. Do you know how many times we have a record of the people of Israel actually observing the year of jubilee? Not once. Not one time. Why? You know why. We know why. Because the people that would make that decision are the people in power. This is a difficult thing to follow. And so not once did they actually observe it. Jesus comes on the scene and he says, all that the year of Jubilee and those laws to protect the vulnerable, what they were meant to point to, I am the fulfillment of. It was all meant to point to me. He pays our debt to God. He sets us free. He puts our broken lives back together. He gives us sight. He liberates us. That comes first. And this brings us to the people of justice. 
We'll, come, we'll return to these ideas and, and how, we, how these are spelled out in God's law in the, in, in the future of this series, but something else is happening here in this story, the people of justice. Jesus comes to make unjust people who are blinded by their own sin, held captive and oppressed by it, and by his amazing grace, turn them into a people of justice. But not everybody likes it or even wants it. Let's go back to the story. Uh, this is this, after Jesus says this one sentence sermon, and I apologize that my sermon's much more than a sentence, but I'm not Jesus, as you know. All spoke well of him and marveled at the gracious words that were coming out of his mouth. All spoke well of him. I, I would like it if they just stopped there. You know, verse 22. They all spoke well of him. They marveled at his words. They said, this is Joseph's boy. He's our guy. The end. But it doesn't end there. And he said to them, doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, physician, heal yourself. What we have heard you did at Capernaum, do here in your hometown as well. Just pause there for a minute. Jesus is kind of poking the bear here. Why does he just leave it alone? They like him. They say, good job. We love this guy. Like, that's, that's all I want when I preach a sermon. Everybody say nice things. Just end it. But, it's not, but Jesus is wiser than that. He knows something about their hearts. And he's unwilling to leave them in their false satisfaction. Their false sense of security. So he presses further. And he says, you're going to quote this proverb, physician, heal yourself. What does he mean? He's saying, you've heard of the miracles I did. I know you want one here. Here's the deal. They, they believe that they have sort of special claim on Jesus. He's our hometown boy. Of all the towns, we should get the miracle. We should get the blessing. I mean, he should do something that blesses this town and my life and our families of all people. I mean, he owes us. We, we knew him when he was Joseph's son. We raised this kid. I knew him when he was a snotty-nosed little dirty kid running around the streets of Nazareth. He owes us. We're his people. You will never understand the grace of Jesus, the justice of God, and the mercy of the gospel if you think you have a claim on him. If we think we have some claim on Jesus, we will miss it. You have no rights when it comes to God. You don't want to have it work that way because then you're in the world of the law. And if you appeal to God on the basis of the law, you're in serious trouble, and so am I. But the gospel operates on grace. So we have no claim. We have no rights. There are no special or privileged people in God's economy, in God's view. Because we go on. Truly I say to you, no prophet is acceptable in his hometown. But in truth I tell you, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the heavens were shut up three years and six months, and a great famine came over the land. And Elijah was sent to none of them, that's a key phrase, but only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon. This is not Israel. These are, this is a pagan land. These are Gentile people. This is a pagan widow Gentile woman. An immoral, religious, and social outsider. The, Jesus says there's lots of widows in Israel, but God passed them by to go to this widow. And then he goes on in the time of Elisha. And there were many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, but none of them was cleansed. But only Naaman, the Syrian. Naaman is a, is a Syrian general. He had murdered, killed in battle Israelite soldiers. He's a leper. He has leprosy. So think about this. You have a poor pagan woman. You have a rich pagan general. Both are outside of the chosen people, God's people, the good people. And what's Jesus saying here? He's saying, if you think you have a claim on God, if you think you have privileges and rights with God, if you think you can demand what's yours from God, the gospel will pass you by. And it will go to those you think are outside, that don't deserve, that don't belong. It's what happened in the Old Testament. It's, what ha it's what's happening in this story in Nazareth. And frankly, friends, it's what's happening in our culture today. It's happening in our hearts right now, if we're not careful. There are no special people. There are no insiders when it comes to the grace of God, when it comes to God's vision of justice. Let's look at Romans chapter 3, verses 22 through 26. This passage, by the way, is one of the central passages that changed Martin Luther's life and sparked the Reformation. The righteousness, and by the way, this word is linked to justice. We'll talk about that in the weeks ahead. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift 
through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus Christ. We could spend weeks of sermons on this passage alone. Let me put it to you simply. Jesus, the just one, justifies our unjust hearts by his grace so that we might become agents of his justice in the world. How do the gospel and justice link up in this simple sentence? Jesus, the only just one, he's both just and justifier, Paul says. He justifies our messed up, screwed up, callous, blind, poor, held captive, wretched hearts so that we might become agents of his justice and his grace in the world. It's what you saw in Ellie LeBron's story. It's what we're going to be talking about throughout this series. But as we move into talking about the application of justice, never let us forget the person and the work of justice ultimately begins and ends with Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Father God, we are unjust people. We think unjust thoughts. We live unjust lives. Even the best of us on our best days fall far short. Your word tells us all have sinned and fall short. We confess that we do. We also, Lord, cry out to you, recognizing our condition. We're hopeless, helpless, and dependent. And we praise you for your mercy and grace. We have no right or claim over you, and yet you shower us with your mercy and grace. And you want to liberate us from our own captivity and then release us into the world to be agents of your justice and your mercy, of your gospel. Help us to see how to do that in a way that honors you, that holds fast to the truth of your word and makes an impact in the world. We give you great praise and thanks. In your name, Jesus, the just and the justifier. Amen.